everybody thank you for joining me again this is a lecture number three and this one is regarding temperature so this is a rather interesting lecture um, temperature um, or should I say connect theory um, is definitely one of my favorite um, topics that I've ever learned about um, my second favorite or maybe tied with this one would be thunderstorms and lightning my second would be the, the uh, transient luminous events, which we'll definitely get into all of those topics later on. Um, thank you for all the views in the last video. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, got a new uh, few subscribers. And I definitely appreciate that as well. So without further ado, let's move on to the lecture about temperature. All right. So let's define temperature. So temperature can be rather difficult to... Uh, to properly define it in our everyday lives we use the word temperature to describe the hotness or coldness of an object well in physics temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecule in a substance if you could add energy to an object its molecules would move faster thus having more kinetic energy therefore its temperature would increase so let's take a look at that So on the left here, we have a cold, uh, we have a cold, colder substance. Looks like this substance is around about five degrees Celsius. You can see there's not really much movement within the molecules here. In the middle here, you can see the temperature is about 20 degrees Celsius. So about 15 degrees warmer than the image on the left. You can see there's a little bit more movement within the molecules. And then this one here over to the right um, is at 40 degrees Celsius which is, you can see here, there is a lot of movement within uh, the molecules. So basically temperature, um, just to reiterate, temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a particular substance. So you can see the warmer the temperature, the faster the molecules move. Let's take a look at temperature scales. So a temperature scale must have at least two fixed points or reference points. The Celsius scale, start with the one in the middle here. Zero degrees C is chosen as the melting point of ice, and 100 degrees C is chosen as the boiling point of water. Take a look at the Kelvin scale, which we use in physics a lot, meteorology as well. So Kelvin on the left here, the zero K is chosen as the coldest theoretical temperature possible, referred to as absolute zero. No object can be cooled down to this temperature yet. We will see with uh, increasing technology, we'll probably be able to get to or near that temperature, but we will see. It might take, who knows, it might take 10 years, or it might take 100 years, or even 500 years, who knows. And then the last temperature scale, which we're shown here, there's also another one called the Rankine scale, but we're not going to cover that one in this lecture. The last one we're going to talk about here is the Fahrenheit scale. So zero degrees Fahrenheit is chosen as the lowest temperature that a mixture of ice, water, and ammonia, ammonia salt, or ammonia chloride, can reach at equilibrium. 52 degrees, or sorry, I should say, 
32 degrees um, is chosen as the freezing point of pure water. 96 degrees Fahrenheit was originally chosen as blood temperature of a healthy person. Now it is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit on the modern Fahrenheit scale. 212 degrees Fahrenheit is chosen as the boiling point of water. Fahrenheit's choice, uh, choices of his fixed points seem arbitrary, yet his exact reasoning was actually never recorded. So that's definitely interesting there to see that they had, his actual reasoning was never recorded. So it was definitely pretty interesting. All right, let's take a look at temperature measurement now. The temperature should always be measured in the shade so that solar radiation does not heat the thermometer and give an exaggerated temperature. Temperature should also never be measured near a building or near blacktop, uh, blacktop pavement. Ideally, a well-ventilated... Uh, well Oops, sorry. I don't know what that was. That was really weird. So ideally, a well-ventilated white instrument shelter should be used. So basically, we can see at the image here. So let's take a look at the top right. Air temperature of 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we take a look at the shaded concrete. We're at 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas the sunlit concrete is at 59 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a lot warmer than the shaded concrete and a little bit warmer than the actual air temperature. Take a look at the shaded grass at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The sunlit grass is at 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And the big winner here is the sunlit asphalt at 66 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see these different temperature measurements um, are pretty much all over the place between 40 degrees and 66 degrees. So it's kind of hard to gauge what the actual air temperature is of that between uh, these surfaces here. But the average, uh, the air temperature here actually was recorded at 54 degrees. All right, let's take a look at isotherms. So isotherms are lines of constant temperature. And that means at every point along a given isotherm, the value of the temperature is the same. So you can see here just south of Pittsburgh, 50 degrees in this particular map. And then if you follow this line all the way down, even into mid Arkansas, middle Arkansas, it's still 50 degrees there. Even down through Texas, 50 degrees. And then here you can see there's a 40 degree line goes from Seattle, Washington, all the way up through Maine. So along this line, every, all the temperatures are the same. Same with Florida down here at 90 degrees. We have uh, 80 degree isotherm all the way up through 20 degree isotherm. So it's definitely pretty interesting just to take a look at that. Now we can take a look at some of the controls of temperature. Let's start with the latitude. So latitude affects both the annual mean or average and the annual range of temperature. The polar regions experience colder annual average temperatures than any other location on Earth. As we will see, other controls of temperature work in unison to make Antarctica and the South Pole colder, uh, colder than the North Pole. Um, the hottest regions on Earth are found near 30 degrees latitude. So let's take a look at that. So 30 degrees latitude. Be right about here. And this is actually not at the equator. The equator would be right around here. The annual range of temperature increases with increasing latitude. There is little to no seasonal changes at the equator, which is very interesting. Now let's take a look at differential heating. So a region surrounded by landmass will have a much larger annual temperature range than a region surrounded by or near a body of water. Oceans are slow to warm during the summer and slow to cool down during the winter. This is uh, partly because water has a higher specific heat capacity than soil. So the specific heat capacity of the ocean is around 3,900 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. And the land or land mass is between 100 and 1,000 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Water has a higher specific heat, so it takes more energy to warm a kilogram of water than to warm a kilogram of soil. Additionally, some of the incoming energy is used to evaporate rather than warm the water. Incoming sunlight penetrates into a body of water and is used to warm a larger mass of water. These three factors mean that water will still warm more slowly and won't get as hot during the summer as land. If you've ever been to the beach in the summer, you probably remember that the sand on the beach gets much hotter during the day than the ocean water. That is because of the difference in specific heat capacities. So definitely another interesting topic there. We we'll definitely might delve into that in a separate lecture, but for now we'll leave it at that. Take a look at the ocean currents. 
So cities on the west coast and east coast of the U.S. can have very different climates, even if they are at the same latitude and altitude. A cold southward flowing ocean current is found along the west coast. A warm Gulf Stream current flows northward along the east coast. And then we'll take a look at, so that I got, so here's what we're talking about here. Here's the current here on the Pacific, so it comes down. And then on the east coast here, you can see the current comes up. So we got warmer waters coming from the equator up to the north. And then we got warmer waters here coming from uh, the equator, been uh, upwelling uh, up to about 30, 40 degrees latitude, then comes down and cools. So it's definitely interesting. Let's take a look at the winds at the mid latitudes. So Winds at mid-latitudes generally blow from west to east. The city on the west coast will feel the full moderating effect of the ocean, and the city on the east coast will be affected by the Atlantic Ocean, but also by winds blowing across the interior of the U.S. So you can see here, you got the westerlies right in the north-central part of the image here. And the rest of this we'll actually explain in a later lecture, which is definitely an interesting lecture there. But let's take a look at altitude. So environmental lapse rates, or as um, state, or defined as temperature falls with height in the troposphere, cannot uh, explain all of the difference between a valley station and a mountain station. Daily temperatures range, gen uh, range generally increases with altitude because the atmosphere is less dense the higher you go up, and solar radiation is more intense the higher you go up. So that's an interesting perspective. But in this graphic, you can see that Right at sea level, it's 30 degrees Celsius. 1,000 meters above, 23.5 degrees Celsius. 2,000 meters above, 17 degrees Celsius. And 3,000 meters above at 10.5 degrees Celsius. So temperature decreases in this graphic at 6.5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet. And let's take a look at the geographic positions. So we have windward versus leeward. The windward is the direction upwind from a point of reference. Leeward, alternatively, is the direction from which the wind is coming, or in a direction downwind from a point of reference. The leeward region of mountains generally remains dry compared to the windward region. The leeward side of an island is protected by the elevation of the island from the prevailing wind and is typically the drier side of an island. Also, in hunting, the animal that is downwind has an advantage. It can smell the upwind animal uh, but the reverse is not true. The downwind animal has the advantage of surprise when hunting the uphill animal. So it's definitely very interesting there. Also, mountains act as shadows, keeping one side colder than the other. And we also have the urban versus rural. So we'll take a look at that. It's definitely a pretty interesting graphic here. So urban areas generally give off more heat than rural areas. Thus, the term urban heat island effect comes into play. Uh, so an urban heat island effect, or UHI, is an urban area or metrop uh, metropolitan area that is significantly warmer than its surrounding rural areas due to human activities. UHI is most noticeable during the summer and winter. The main cause of the UHI um, is from the modification of land surfaces. You can see rural, you're looking just at 85 degrees there. Move into the suburban residential, you start to get up to 87 degrees. Commercial, you get a little bit higher at 88. And right in the heart of downtown, 92. So you can see we've already increased by 7 degrees. Um, just do that, you know, just through that little uh, expanse there. And then as you move over, urban residential, you're at about 89 degrees. Parks, you're down to about 86 and then back down to suburban residential, you get that little influx of heat again up to 88. And then rural farmland, you go down to 85 or 84 degrees. It's definitely pretty interesting there. This actually happens in Pittsburgh a lot. So we'll definitely maybe uh, maybe make an entire lecture on this as well. It could be pretty interesting. But let's take a look at cloud cover and albedo. So during the day, clouds lead to colder temperatures. At night, clouds lead to warmer temperatures. So basically, daytime clouds, they reflect solar radiation back into space. Nighttime clouds, they absorb radiation emitted by Earth, which is known as the blanket effect. Snow absorbs less radiation than the bare ground and results in colder temperatures. Dirty snow absorbs more radiation than fresh snow, which is definitely interesting. 
It happens a lot here in Pennsylvania. We get dirty snow all over the ground, and we actually get a little bit um, warmer temperatures. So that's uh, we get another snowstorm after that. That's why we usually don't get a lot of snow. We have little microclimates and things like that that happen around here. So it's definitely pretty interesting. Let's take a look at humidity. So since water vapor is a greenhouse gas, as we discussed in the last lecture, then in general, humid nights are warmer than dry nights. That's just due to the greenhouse effect. And then we also have wind mixing. So wind mixes the air near the ground. During the day, the warmest air is usually near the ground. Because of the mixing, the wind will move cooler air towards the ground. At night, the coolest air is usually near the ground. And because of mixing, the wind will move uh, warm air toward the ground at night. So in general, windy nights are warmer than calm nights. And windy days are colder than warm days. Let's take a look at the uh, global temperature distribution. So temperature decrease from the tropics to the poles. And you can see that. Um, so you can see that 80 degrees here. And then you go up. And temperature gets a lot colder. About uh, 20 degrees up there. So the spacing of isotherms or lines or gradients of temperature is not uniform with longitude. This is due to ocean currents and land sea contrast. So you can see longitude here, and you can see it's not uniform at all. So you can see 90 degrees longitude, definitely not uniform. Latitude, it is pretty uniform now. So the band of maximum temperature migrates with the seasons. The hottest and coldest temperatures are over land due to the lower specific heat capacity. And just for fun, just wanted to add this in there. So the hottest temperature ever recorded occurred on July 10th, 1913. Um, at the Greenland Ranch in Death Valley, the reading was 134 degrees Fahrenheit. So definitely, that's definitely a very hot temperature. Hi, Hopper. Nice to see you in the office, buddy. <laughs> he wanted to join us for the lectures. I'll have to post some videos up of Hopper. Um, he's pretty cool. And just to show you some contrast, um, big shout out to Knowledge Fusion for this image here. So the coldest temperature occurred July 21st, 1983 at the Soviet Vostok station in Antarctica. Um, the reading uh, was at minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's definitely interesting. You can see the two extremes there from 134 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 126 degrees Fahrenheit. And interestingly enough, both of them occurred in July. Now let's take a look at the temperature cycles. So the diurnal or daily cycle. So time of daily temperature maximum does not coincide with the time of maximum solar radiation. Maximum temperature usually occurs in the afternoon hours. The minimum usually occurs near sunrise. Daily temperature variation is smaller on a windward coast and clouds and wind both decrease the daily temperature variation. So you can see there's a little bit of lag going on there. Let's see here. Let's take a look at the annual cycle. So months of annual temperature maximum do not coincide with months of maximum solar radiation. July and August are usually the hottest months in the U.S., but the solar uh, solar maximum solar radiation occurs in June. So month of annual temperature minimum does not co coincide with month of minimum solar radiation. Hopper, what are you doing, buddy? All right, and let's take a look at a, a few um, useful temperature indices just to end the lecture here, guys. First, we'll start off with degree days. So heating and cooling degree days. It's used to estimate the energy consumption for the heating and cooling of a building. Assume no heating or cooling if the temperature is at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So we find the difference between the daily mean temperature, daily average temperature, and 65 degrees. So you just take the temperature average minus 65 degrees. Every one degree difference is a heating uh, degree day if negative or a cooling degree day if positive. So let's just show the interesting equations that actually go into this. So the heating degree day would be this equation up top. So it's definitely pretty interesting. Uh, it's definitely a nice uh, equation from statistics. And then cooling degree day, the same thing. But it's it's definitely interesting just to see some of these uh, equations 
I, mean, I try to show some of them. Not too many of them, but definitely try to show a little bit of them. All right. Just hang on one second. Let me see if I can pause this for one second. All right. Sorry about that. Hopper was going nuts in my office. I had to pause that for a second. He's definitely an interesting little dude. <laughs> All right. So, take a look at uh, the wind chill factor. So, the wind chill factors in effects of wind and evaporation on the human sensation of temperature to give a wind chill equivalent temperature. The thermometer reads its air temperature, not the wind chill equivalent temperature. So you can see, I'm um, going from right to left here. You can see the wind speed at 25 miles per hour, just say. And your temperature is minus 10. That means your wind chill factor is at minus 37 degrees. So you can see it takes about 10 minutes for a frostbite to set in. And if you're at minus 35 degrees and you have a wind speed of 25, your wind chill would be at minus 71 degrees, so it would take five minutes or less for uh, frostbite to set in. So it's definitely an interesting temperature uh, indice there. And lastly, let's take a look at the heat index. So heat index factors in the effect of humidity on the human sensation of temperature. So this has occurred recently, um, especially here in Pennsylvania also, and in definitely the Southwest. And this uh, big heat wave is actually coming back into Pittsburgh um, tomorrow and uh, also for Wednesday. So we're definitely gonna have some of this extreme heat um, we'll probably be in a danger zone. Um, so we're looking at, let's see here. So we'll be about 92 degrees, a little bit, but 90 degrees tomorrow. And relative humidity will be about 65%. So we're going to be in the extreme caution. So sunstroke, muscle cramps, and or heat exhaustion possible. And we're right on the, uh, the line there of the extreme caution in the danger zone. So sunstroke, muscle cramps, and or heat exhaustion likely. So definitely, if you're out and about um, in the Pittsburgh area, definitely um, stay hydrated. Try to not be outside for uh, long periods of time. Um, but unfortunately for Wednesday, we're looking at between 94 and 96 for the high. And we're looking at about 70% humidity. Uh, so we're definitely in the danger to extreme uh, danger zone. So heat exhaustion, muscle cramps, sunstroke, uh, likely or highly likely. So... Definitely uh, make sure you stay hydrated. Check on your elderly neighbors. Uh, make sure you're staying cool. Um, try not to stay outside in prolonged uh, periods of time. Um, if you can, just go inside for a couple minutes and then go back outside and do, do the rest of your work. But All right, guys. So thank you for joining me for lecture number three. Definitely look forward to this. I hope that we can get Justin in on some of these lectures, especially the thunderstorm one. I definitely want him to be a part of that. 
But I, I mean, I want him to be a part of all these lectures, but unfortunately he's at work right now, which I understand. I'll be at work tomorrow, so next day off is not until Saturday or Sun. I'm uh, sorry, Saturday, um, Sunday, Sunday and Monday I'm off. Um, but I usually uh, get off of work around 1.30 in the afternoon, so hopefully I'll be able to do a few more lectures um, this week. Um, also Saturday I'm going to a big event, um, just the celebration of the 4th of July, a little early celebration. Uh, this takes place down in Cokeburg, um, so I'm going to take the drone down with me. Hopefully I can get some uh, aerial shots of the fireworks exploding. Of course I'm going to keep the drone fur uh, further away. Uh, from the fireworks, I'm not going to be up on them, so that way the drone gets hit. But yeah, we're definitely going to get some cool footage that day. So definitely stay tuned for that. I am going to live stream that on Facebook. So if you haven't done so, please go to Facebook and check out World Weather Authority. Um, but I will post that video once I get home onto YouTube as well. So um, if you don't want to subscribe or follow the uh, Facebook page, you can always uh, watch that here on YouTube as well. Um, but for those that do follow the Facebook page, it will be live streamed on Facebook. So that'll definitely be interesting. But yeah, I definitely appreciate you guys. Um, big shout out to Dark Waters as well. Um, he's given me the confidence and um, just, you know, sort of the uh, little bit of coaching, you know, that I that I needed for this. Um, just just by, you know, having him comment and um just just being friends with him he's a good dude um definitely check out iamdarkwaters.com it is highly recommended if you're into horror um it is definitely um he's one of the best i can tell you that right now um definitely check out vault of nightmares also he's very good um definitely lakea check out lakea on youtube as well big shout out but all right guys and then also um if you do have the means to do so and uh, if you want to, um, please consider donating to our page at paypal.me slash worldweatherauthority. Any amount helps. Uh, we're definitely looking to get some more technology going. And I definitely want to try to get up the subscribers here. I know you have to have a thousand subscribers and a whole bunch of hours and stuff. Um, I'm going to look into those guidelines um, pretty soon. Because I definitely want to try to stream to both Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. But I know there's, there's certain stipulations you have to meet first. But... I definitely appreciate it, guys. Never stop chasing.